Hi, and welcome to another edition of Bibles Fast. Uh, today, we're going to look at that several people, almost everybody, has an opinion on what they must do to be saved or have their sins washed away. Only one opinion counts, that is God's. So what does the Bible say in that matter? That's what we want to look at today. We had previously uploaded a video on the conversion of Saul of Tarsus and uh, on his conversion on the road to Damascus and their foreword uh, in the city and uh, it pretty well met every popular opinion today of what one must do to be saved or have their sins washed away. For example, Paul had great tradition and he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Paul lived in all good conscience toward this day. He was basically a good person. He believed in Christ, having heard the heavenly voice. He accepted Jesus into his heart. He said, Lord, what do you want me to do to be, what do you want me to do? And the Lord Jesus told him, you'll be told what you must do in the city. And he prayed incessantly for three nights, three days. Neither did he eat or drink, but prayed. And he would have said the sinner's prayer of all sinner's prayer. He had the laying on of the hands of the Ananias. But yet, at what point were his sins washed away? Acts 22 and 16. Now, why are you waiting? Ananias said, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling in the name of the Lord. You see that his sins were not washed away at any other point other than and baptism at the end, calling in the name of the Lord. Apostle Paul later said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to salvation for the Jew and the Greek, everybody. What is the gospel? Well, Christ cleared that up for us too, very clearly. In Mark 16 and 15, you'll notice that the word gospel is used there. And it's to be preached to every creature you and me and the Apostle Paul, everyone. Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Is this not the same procedure that uh, Saul undertook to have his sins washed away? He believed and he was baptized, and then his sins were washed away. Not before. The Apostle Paul also said that he received the long suffering of Christ. It took some time for him to smarten up, so to speak, or come to his senses, and Christ was long suffering during that time. And it would be a pattern. To those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. So here's what Saul did. Same as what Jesus taught in Mark 16:16. 16, 16. Look at the image uh, of the back of the head with the light bulb. That stands for belief in Christ. And then Saul was baptized. And he had remission of sin, or he was saved. That's the same as what Christ said, to be preached to everyone. And that's the pattern that everyone must do to be saved, to have their sins washed away. You believe first, then you're baptized, and you have remission of sin. When I went to school, 1 plus 1, of course, equal 2. And the same here. Believe first, 1, and 
plus we baptized another one equals two seed. The Apostle Paul is clearly an example or pattern showing what the Bible meaning of to believe on him for everlasting life fully means. Again, here's what Jesus said. Believe first and be baptized equal salvation. One plus one equals two. Here are some popular differences taught other than what the Bible says, what Jesus taught. Some might say, well, you're baptized as a baby unknowingly, and then at age 12 you are confirmed or you believe, and that would equal salvation. This is the direct opposite of what Jesus taught, is it not? So therefore, it's wrong. Others may say, well, just believe only and then you're saved. And you can be baptized if you want, but it's not really necessary. That too is different than from what Christ taught. And therefore, that opinion is inaccurate. Other people say, well, just believe only and you'll be saved. As again, is that what Jesus taught? No, clearly not. So again, that opinion is wrong. James would say in chapter 2 and 17, Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now that's not works of merit, but works of obedience. And uh, furthermore, in verse 19, you believe there is one God, you do well, that's a great start. Even the demons believe and tremble, but they're not going to do what God says, unfortunately. And unfortunately, if you believe there is one God, it's a great start, but you need to do what God says, what Jesus says. Examples of unsaved believers. Uh, belief only. Remember Rahab, way back in time, in the city of Jericho, that fell with the Greek walls fell in, and the Israelites led by Joshua. Uh, that that city was first in their land of promise, land of Canaan, and all the city, all the members, all the people of the city, they believed and trembled as the army of Israel led by God was about to take the city, you can find that in Joshua 2, 9 to 11. Now keep that in mind. They did believe mentally. However, Rahab was the only one to act on her belief. Joshua 2 and 12. For example, she hid the spies, sent them out in another direction, and asked that, she and whoever might be in her household would be saved. <coughs> Excuse me. In Hebrews 11.31, although the others believed mentally, they did not act, and they were classified as unbelievers. That's not me saying that. That's God in the Bible. Although they believe mentally, they're classified as unbelievers, except for Ahab, because they failed to act. Another example, the Pharisees, the rulers, in John 12 and 42 to 43, believed in Jesus, but he, they did not do what he said to do, and did that render them saved or unsaved and you have to be very logical and sincere and say that they're unsaved even though they believed in Jesus they would not do what they needed to do so you can be 
uh, unsaved believer. So that brings us to the question, what is baptism? Well, God's not the author of confusion. However, we need to come to grips with the fact that there are false spirits or false teachers. In fact, 1 John 4 and 1 says, test them because many false prophets or false teachers have gone into the world. So therefore, not every opinion taught religiously is necessarily taught in the Bible and you need to test them. Man has become the author of confusion, changing the mode of baptism and the concept in our minds to whatever may seem convenient. For example, uh, man has introduced sprinkling and pouring as baptism. It's a manner of convenience, but is that what the mode of baptism is in the Bible? The better question is then, what is Bible baptism? Bible baptism is from the English word baptize, is translated from the original Greek word baptizo, meaning to make whelmed or fully immersed in water, underwater. Not sprinkling or pouring, but going down into the water, fully covering you, and coming up out of the water. Now, John the Baptist was baptizing in Anon near Salem because there was much water, and they came and were baptized. Why did John need much water? Couldn't he just pour or sprinkle a little bit? No, much water was needed that the candidate be buried under water and come up out of the water. Colossians 2 and 12, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. We need to be completely buried. And we all know what that means if we use the example of a loved one or someone dying, uh, we bury them well under the dirt. We don't sprinkle and pour a little dirt on them and leave them out in the field, for goodness sake. We bury them. That's a rather extreme and maybe distasteful example, but it's a good, good one. Good example to highlight what buried means. Now, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip went down toward Gaza, the desert, and there was, behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch under Candace the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning sitting in his chariot and reading Isaiah we now know it as Isaiah 53 the prophecy of the Lord Jesus and the spirit said to Philip go near and overtake his chariot I might add just because he was a worshiper it does not render him saved. One has to follow the pattern and obey the gospel of Christ to be taught to everyone. And note the eunuch was a worshiper. He even made a super long trek from Ethiopia to Jerusalem in a horse-drawn carriage many, many miles. But yet, even though he went there to worship God, he was not saved at this point. So Philip ran to him and said, Do you understand what you're reading? He said, No, come up and guide me into what is said. So 
So Philip joined him in the chariot. And the place in the scripture he read was this, from Isaiah 53. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before its shear is silent, and opened not his mouth. In verse 34, the eunuch asked Philip, said, Does this man prophesy of himself or some other man? So the stage is set. So what does Philip do? He opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now, I don't know, I wasn't a fly in the wall to know exactly what was all in that sermon. I wish I could hear it, but I was not privy to it. And you are not privy to it. However, we know this much, that in preaching Jesus, Philip taught the necessity of baptism. You can't preach Jesus and salvation of his without preaching that pattern. And Philip did. How do I know? Because of the eunuch's question. As they went further down the road, Acts 8, 36, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? I want you to concentrate. What hinders him from being baptized? What hindered him? He had to believe first. Remember the pattern. Remember the teaching of Jesus and taught to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. What hindered him? He had to believe first. Look at what Philip said to him. Acts 8, 37, Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And conversely, if you don't believe with all your heart, you may not. However, the eunuch gave the good confession, expression of faith, and he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he was a candidate for baptism. First Peter 3.21 There is an antitype or like figure uh, that saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So baptism includes the answer of a good conscience toward God or otherwise repentance of sins that you have committed and recognition of them. Now we know the eunuch was not married. That's what a eunuch is. And he wouldn't have a wife or children. But let's say, for example, that there was a baby in the buggy with the eunuch. What would hinder it, him or her, from being baptized? The same as the eunuch. If you believe with all your heart, if you are baptized, giving an answer of a good conscience toward God, you'll be saved. Can a baby believe with all his heart or give an answer of a good conscience toward God? Of course he can't. And therefore that would disqualify that baby. You see, it's for someone who has reached the age of accountability that they first have to believe in Christ and in, in being baptized, they give an answer of their own good conscience toward God, meaning a 180 turn, repents, a change in life. The baby is not capable of this. Ezekiel 18:20a, the soul who sins shall die. 
The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. That baby is not born depraved of Adam's sin or the father's sin. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father. It is the addition of men, not God, to say that babies are born totally depraved of inherited sin and thus need to be baptized or christened by sprinkling. That is not the case. Here is an example of Old Testament Israelites. Nehemiah 3, Ezra read from the open square from morning till midday before men, women, and children? No, before men and women and those who could understand the law. And the ears of the people were attentive to the book of the law. Usually at age 12, an Israelite become amenable to the law. Before then, they were exempt. They're innocent, sin-free. They're not born totally depraved. They're exempt from the law. And today we're we become amenable to the perfect law of Christ when we reach the age of accountability. It is then our choice if we want to obey the pattern or the gospel. It is our choice if we want to believe that he is the Christ and be baptized for the mission of our sin. And notice the mode of baptism in this case of conversion. So uh, in Acts chapter 8:38, he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized them. Note they didn't go to the riverside and cupped a little bit of water and either poured it or sprinkled it on his head. That would have been convenient, but that's not the Bible definition of baptism. They both went down into the water and he baptized him. Look in verse 39. Now when they had come up out of the water, the spirit caught Philip away and the eunuch went his way rejoicing. That's the mode we see here in this example of conversion. The mode of baptism is a complete burial under water. And that's what Philip did to the eunuch. <clears throat> it is very clear the, the mode of Bible baptism is immersion. They went down in the water, the eunuch was baptized, and they come up out of the water. There's no sprinkling or pouring involved. Perhaps you have questions that have arisen from this Bible answer. Or you feel I have misrepresented the truth. Or maybe you want to learn more. And just leave a comment if you would like to learn more. There are many options. There's a free, they're all free, correspondence course that you can do in the mail with all scripture references within it given in case you don't have a Bible. Um, we could also meet on the phone. We could also meet if I'm in your area at your house or my house or a public venue like Tim Hortons. There are lots of ways that you can learn more. And God expects you to learn for yourself the Bible and that you come to the conviction that you believe 
on Jesus and you're baptized for the remission of your sin. That's it for today. I'm, I'm really glad you listened. And if you have any questions, like I said, feel free to comment.